The following podcast was recorded on Thursday, January 26, 2023, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Reddish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Welcome, Sam. Good morning, Kristen. Today, we are looking forward to talking about something that might have been overlooked. When you think about the lingering effects of the pandemic, what about the healthcare industry? Even though beds were packed, was it a good time to be in the industry? I guess the big question is, was it a boom or a bust for the healthcare sector? So it was kind of both, right? It was it was both a boom and a bust. Like everything with COVID, there's always a caveat and there's always longer term implications one way or another uh, with, with how things played out and how things reopened, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the healthcare industry is one of those that when we say healthcare one, it is extremely broad, but two, it's really important to remember what exactly the majority of money is made on in the healthcare industry. And that's that's not taking up ICU beds, that's not uh, being refunded by the government, that's elective and cosmetic surgeries. Uh, that's really where you begin to make a significant amount of your money. And that's really where uh, the hospital systems uh, make their profit. Uh, so when you begin to shut down an economy with COVID, while you may have all of your beds, and in some cases, you know, well over 100% of your beds filled, those aren't really profitable beds, right? Those aren't, you're not getting paid a lot for those beds. So you begin to have your margin shrink and you begin to have some significant financial trouble. I think that's really been overlooked over time as a consequence of COVID. Right. Everybody, you know, it seems like we decided that it was just a boom and we were going to be perfectly fine in the healthcare industry. And that's just not really the case, uh, particularly during COVID. Not to mention that in the wake of COVID, you had a number of staff that were overworked, that had never seen anything like it, and then had to work in very, very dangerous conditions during that time that either burned out or left the industry. Uh, it's, you know, it was a very, very difficult time uh, to be a nurse or a doctor uh, when you were working very, very long shifts and afraid that you were going to, in fact, uh, contract COVID. Uh, so I think, I think we, we kind of glance over it uh, a little bit too much. It was one of the weaker and longer to recovery, uh, particularly on the employment front. Uh, when it had really been a sector of employment that one is typically very high paying uh, relative to most professions, uh, but it was a real grower pre-pandemic in terms of employment. Um, that really took a long time to come back and it really hasn't returned to its longer term trajectory uh, in terms of hiring. And a lot of that is because, well, it takes a long time to really re-accelerate uh, the number of jobs you have open and have the confidence that, you know, the pandemic's over and you're not going to con potentially contract COVID. So speaking of employment, um, can you tell us a little bit more about where employment um, peaked, meaning where as states reopened, who's seen the most rise in their numbers? Sure. So it's, it's, it's really interesting because when you look at how the economies reopened, the U.S. economy didn't reopen all at once, right? We're not like China where we just said, okay, the economy is open. Uh, in the U.S., we did it state by state. And, you know, there were Texas and Florida were two of the fastest to reopen and reopened dramatically and quickly. Uh, and both of those uh, tend to be uh, places where people move from the coast uh, for tax reasons uh, and or move when they retire, like Florida. Uh, and that's really something to keep in mind when you think about that healthcare industry is that Florida and Texas both have very, very large healthcare industries uh, that cater to uh, individuals that travel for healthcare. Um, Texas, particularly Houston, has a significant Latin American 
um, healthcare uh, population uh, in Florida has a significant uh, older uh, and elderly uh, population that does a lot of elective type surgeries, right? You wanna, if you want your knee replaced, uh, you go, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to do it in your home country. You, you come to the U.S. and, you know, it, we're a destination for it. Uh, so Texas and Florida really benefited from opening earlier on that front. Uh, granted, you know, there was there was some uh, elective surgery. You can do it. You can't do it uh, in Texas. There was a reopening in April and all of a sudden in April 2020, very early, where all of a sudden you could do elective surgeries. Uh, and then in May it was you can't do elective surgeries. And then by June and July, you could do them again. Uh, so there was there was a little bit of a head fake there. But that reopening really accelerated uh, the GDP rate uh, gains coming out of the pandemic, particularly for Florida. Uh, Texas had a little bit too much oil, and it, sometimes people forget that oil went negative, so it wasn't the best time to be in the oil industry. So it's a little bit difficult to parse out the benefit of healthcare versus what happened in the oil patch during that time. But you can see from Florida's rapid, rapid gains coming out of COVID that reopening early and having that, call it healthcare and job stability was really, really something that benefited them longer term. And what are the lasting effects on the economies? This is, this is an interesting one because I think it has a lot to do both with the pandemic itself um, and the confidence that people had in one, reco economies reopening and being able to get the health care that they needed. I think that's a big benefit to both Texas and Florida uh, in terms of net migration and longer term. You know, a lot of people moved to Texas and a lot of people moved to Florida. Uh, so that is a significant tailwind to those economies over time. And so this is something that is going to be very, very long lasting. It's also worth remembering that those elective surgeries, cosmetic surgeries, et cetera, we are still have a pretty significant backlog, both in the U.S. and globally. I mean, this was a global lockdown. This was global, pretty much global in developed markets of where you could not undertake an elective surgery for a, an extended period of time. That's going to take a long time to work through. If you look at some of the earnings reports that have come out recently uh, for companies that provide uh, the devices that can be considered elective, uh, hips, knees, um, joints, that type of uh, thing, the, the earnings have been very, very good relative to uh, what might have been anticipated in some cases. So I think there's a very, very long tailwind here as we begin to work through a backlog of elective surgeries uh, that really, you know, you do kind of need, right? They're, you know, cosmetic you might not need, um, but in, in elective surgery that involves replacing a knee or a hip, while it might be considered elective, is something you really need to do at some point. Sam, as the last of the countries who have been locked down by COVID begin to reopen, what's the impact on healthcare? Uh, this is this is a really interesting one, particularly which countries are opening, and that's China. Um, you know, China is one of the larger um, places that when you are allowed to travel, you may come to the U.S. for healthcare. right? The, the U.S. healthcare system um, is very, very good, or Canada, um, for elective surgeries and the like. And there is probably a significant amount of pent-up demand coming out of China in the future on that front. And we don't have great data on it. Obviously, there's no great data on China, but it's it's a billion plus people that likely have been deferring at least some of their health care. In summary today, Sam, we do want to know, is that boom coming and what should we be watching for next? So it's interesting. It's, it's hard to call it a boom, um, mostly because you, you can't just do elective surgeries all day. Right? It's, it's going, it's something that you have to schedule. It's something that you, know, you can only you know, call it do a few per day, right, on average. It's not like you can expand the ability to do it. So it's hard to say it'll be a boom, but it's a long-term tailwind. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, it's not going to be a straight line up and to the right, but it is going to be one thing that I think we talk about for years to come in terms of how long it really takes to get through this, because one, we don't have that many doctors coming through the system, right? We don't, we're not adding capacity uh, to perform these procedures. Uh, so it's, it's going to take a long time, uh, but the, the tailwind uh, is, is here. 
Well, thank you, Sam, for your thoughts today, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianca Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.